so much for being here, Alex. You're very welcome. Jesse, over to you. Thanks, Marie. It's T minus one hour and about 17 minutes from launch, and it always gets more and more exciting as we continue to get closer to that T zero. Now, crew has already ingressed the vehicle. They have been helped out by our closeout team. Um, to get into their seats and get buckled in, um, attach their umbilicals to the spacecraft, which provide breathing air and comms to Dragon. And then they've completed comm checks and suit leak checks. Um, and those comm Dragon checks SpaceX, were completed with the, the core the here. The endurance copies. All right, and confirmation that the closeout team is now departing. So after those suit leak checks, the closeout team was able to close and seal the hatch, which also gets its own leak check. As we just heard, the closeout team has departed and those final weather checks are coming up, which will be necessary before that final go, no go is given for Dragon launch. SpaceX, the closeout and team has departed the crew. Before we get that final go, no go, the various teams at both NASA and SpaceX will do an internal go poll, making sure conditions are right with Falcon 9, the Dragon, the, the crew, the space. range, and the space station before the final go is given. Now let's check back in on Houston for a status on the team supporting the space station on their readiness for launch. Sandra, how's it going? Thanks, Jesse. The team here in Mission Control Houston remains go for launch. All systems on board the station that are required to be healthy for this mission are continuing to look good. Before the station team is go for launch, they must verify that key systems on board the station are functioning as expected. This includes life support systems like oxygen generation, carbon dioxide removal, and the water recycling system that allows us to reuse about 90% of the water we send to station. We're also ensuring that the computers that allow us to command station's major subsystems, essentially the station's nervous system, are functioning normally. We also work with our Russian counterparts to ensure both methods of controlling the station's attitude are fully functional. This includes the large U.S. gyroscopes and the thrusters found on the Russian segment. Both systems play a critical role during Dragon's docking. Mission Control Houston will closely monitor the crew's flight and will continue to check off milestones for most of the journey. So I'll send it back to Hawthorne. The International Space Station team is ready for launch. Courtney. Thanks, Sandra. We're so happy to hear that the space station team is ready for launch. As we mentioned, the Crew-3 astronauts will spend about six months aboard the International Space Station. They're starting their journey after the departure of the Crew-2 astronauts from the space station. Crew-2 splashed down off the Florida coast Monday night, where um, they were picked up at sea by SpaceX's GO Navigator recovery vessel. Next, SpaceX will launch Commercial Resupply Mission 24, or CRS-24, to Space Station to deliver cargo and supplies to Crew-3 and the astronauts and cosmonauts aboard. It will automatically dock to the International Docking Adapter 3 on the space-facing port of the station's Harmony module. Before Crew-3 returns home, they will hand the baton to the next crew to arrive at the orbiting lab on Crew Dragon, the Crew-4 crew. That mission is targeted to launch in April of next year, and it will carry Crew Dragon Commander and NASA astronaut Chell Lindgren, pilot Bob Hines of NASA, and mission specialist Samantha Cristoforetti of the European Space Agency, or ESA, and a fourth crew member who has yet to be named. The Crew-4 astronauts will also complete a six-month mission as expedition crew members aboard the space station. Now they will be joined there by three additional crewmates who will launch on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft and this will mean that seven people will be on the space station at one time allowing NASA to increase the amount of science conducted in space. That's right, and this will be Chell Lindgren's second trip into space following a 141-day stay at the space station in 2015 for Expeditions 44 and 45. Before being selected as an astronaut in 2009, he was, he was a flight surgeon supporting space shuttle and space station missions. In December 2020, NASA named him as one of the Artemis team of astronauts helping to pave the way for NASA's upcoming lunar missions. Bob Hines, a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force, was selected as an astronaut in 2017 and will be making his first trip into space on Crew-4. 
Before becoming an astronaut, he supported multiple military deployments in the Middle East, Africa, and Europe, served as a flight test pilot for the Federal Aviation Administration, and flew as a research pilot at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. And ESA astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti will be making her second trip to space as a mission specialist on Crew 4. She was selected as an ESA astronaut in 2009 and flew to the International Space Station in 2014 aboard a Russian Soyuz for a long duration mission as part of Expedition 42 and 43. Cristoforetti is planned to take over as station commander for Expedition 68 and will be the first woman from ESA to do so. Now let's head over to Daryl at Kennedy Space Center. Daryl, how's it going over there? All right, it's very good, Courtney. We are having clear skies at the moment. Uh, we can see some stars here at Kennedy, and that's great news. And if you're just joining us, welcome to coverage for the mission known as Crew-3, NASA and SpaceX's fourth flight of astronauts to the International Space Station. We are at T-minus one hour and 11 minutes until launch, liftoff time, still holding for 9.03 p.m. Eastern time, and we're tracking no issues with Falcon 9 or with Dragon. The range is green, and the weather, it's cooperating. Moving on out, we had a light shower earlier, but it is gone. The range is now green, and so over the last three hours, our crew of Raja Chari, uh, Tom Marshburn, Kayla Barron, and Matthias Maurer, they donned their SpaceX suits in the historic crew quarters suit up room. They walked out of the crew quarters building as every NASA astronaut has done since Apollo 7. And then they were transported to the pad where they climbed inside the SpaceX Crew Dragon Endurance. And now we are seeing them live while they await liftoff. And Shannon, what is the crew doing right now in, in these moments as they wait? Yeah, it's, uh, they are waiting, but they know that they're getting closer and closer to launch. The time really starts to feel like it's speeding up, especially when we get that launch escape system armed. But what they're doing is they're thinking about their tasks ahead. They're thinking about uh, running through the nominal procedures as well as running through any emergency procedures that, that uh, in case they need them. If you remember back in April, and we've talked a lot about this, uh, we launched uh, NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough, uh, Megan MacArthur, JAXA astronaut, and uh, Aki Hoshide and ESA astronaut Thomas Pesquet to the space station and those four returned from their six-month mission. Um, Shane Kimbrough saying after he splashed down, it's great to be back on <laughs> planet Earth. It's always nice to come home. <laughs> it is. And so, not that I would know, I've just, uh, you've told me a few times it is great to come it back is home. Great. It's just, you know, it's a long journey, so it is nice to go home to somewhere familiar. Over the next hour, we will conduct a series of polls the pad crew uh, has departed, and we watch uh, them leave the area as we zoom out. We get ready for launch uh, through these series of poles. The crew will also arm the launch escape system, and fueling of the Falcon 9 will then begin. Launch, of course, set for 9.03 p.m. Eastern, and this will include a 12-minute flight to orbit, and then a roughly 22-hour flight to dock with the International Space Station at 7.10 p.m. Eastern on Thursday, November 11th, which is Veterans Day. And it's not lost on us that we have two active military members on this flight. Um, and so it, it, it seems fitting, a day that we remember all veterans who have served. Right, yes, it's important to recognize our veterans and um, NASA ha definitely has a long history of working with the military service. We are a civilian organization, but they do provide some expertise to us. And as you pointed out, we've got two active duty military on that flight. Many test pilots from the military ranks have uh, come through NASA, of course. Uh, th that yep. was certainly true in the early days of the space program, and it's still true today. It's still true today, but uh, we also have non-military people, such as myself, so we take a lot of scientists and engineers that uh, are not affiliated with the military. As we look outside at the launch pad at uh, 39A, for those who don't know, this is a very vast place. Kennedy Space Center shares land with the 140,000 acre Merritt Island Wildlife Refuge, so that's why when you're looking there, it's just so dark in so much of the picture. Uh, even when we're a far distance from the launch pad, it's uh, an area that has been preserved for a very long time, for decades going back. And since it is Native American Heritage Month here in the month of November, we should mention that this was land once occupied by indigenous tribes, including the Ais and the Tumukwa. A quick history of NASA's commercial crew program. It all began with the first successful and historic test flight 
with NASA astronauts called DEMO-2. After that, NASA certified SpaceX to fly astronauts regularly to and from the International Space Station. And the first rotational mission was, of course, drum roll please, <laughs> Crew-1. Shannon, that was a big deal because it really, it was the first time in more than a decade since Space Shuttle retired for longer duration space flights. This was the first one, you were on it, and you flew up there and spent almost six months in space. That's right, we did spend almost six months in space, and we make a big deal about this being the first capsule because even though it has made it to space, there's still things that uh, we need to see how it ages um, during its time on orbit. So we're constantly looking at its systems and making sure that everything is working properly so we can keep crew up there um, as long as we need them. And a lot of what you experienced then fl uh, you know, flowed back into improvements that were made for this brand new spacecraft. Absolutely, each time a crew comes back, just as we did, we give um, uh, comments and what we call lessons learned and maybe some suggestions on how to make things a little bit better. Um, and so SpaceX is good and NASA is good and they try and uh, flow those improvements in whenever they can. A lot of those improvements made on this capsule. We've been hearing a little from the crew on board uh, Dragon currently strapped into their seats as you can see there. Helmets mid-level so they can look below them. They have completed their communications and suit leap checks. Uh, they're able to follow all the milestones, Shannon, still ahead on those displays as you've been telling us. Just above them they are getting insight into all of the Dragon and Falcon 9 systems as we proceed and march ever so slowly towards launch. And then at uh, T minus one hour and five minutes, let's go ahead and check in for a status update from John I at SpaceX headquarters. John? The good news is we've had a smooth countdown and the SpaceX team is getting ready to pick up the pace here in the last hour. Now our next major activity happens at T minus one hour when the SpaceX closeout team actually gets out of the blast danger area. They've already left the crew access arm and are leaving the launch complex. That just leaves the crew on board Dragon inside of 39A complex. Now Falcon 9, as you can see on the screen, the two stage reusable rocket. We've done our final propulsion checkouts of the first and second stages and the engines began just a few minutes ago in preparation for propellant loading. So we're testing and cycling valves on the engine. We're checking the engine pneumatics pressurization system right now. At T minus 45 minutes, the team will report their readiness for propellant load with a final electronic go-no-go -no -go pole. Now, before we can start loading propellant on the Falcon 9, we have a couple of major tasks to perform with respect to Dragon. First, after the pole is complete, we're going to retract that crew access arm that you can see alongside Dragon from the fixed service structure. We're gonna move that away to launch position. That'll happen approximately between T minus 44 and T minus 42 minutes. With the arm out of the way, the crew will arm the launch escape system. Once these two events are complete, Dragon is ready for Falcon to begin propellant loading. On the weather front, we're also verifying that we meet all the constraints. And as we mentioned a little bit earlier, Everything both at ground level and at upper altitude looks good and ready to support an on-time launch in just over 64 minutes. So with everything looking good right now, the range is also ready to support from historic launch pad 39A, the worldwide network of ground stations and the tracking and data relay satellites are ready to support Dragon as it heads into orbit. Everything is looking good for that instantaneous launch window at 9.03.31 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is two hours, three minutes, 31 seconds universal time. As a reminder, once we begin loading propellant, there's no opportunity to change the T0. Timing for Dragon Rendezvous with the International Space Station is very precise, down to the second, so we're gonna get one chance at it today. But the good news coming up just over 63 minutes and counting, we are go for launch, Jesse. Great, thank you, John. I, it's always great to hear that we have everything Dragon go SpaceX. for our T0. Cycling orbit tank isolation valves to equalize low flow pressure at this time. Additionally, you are go for section six. When ready, report go for launch. Endurance copies of the cycling um, pressurization valves, and we are go for section six. Awesome, just hearing some comms from the teams. 
Today's launch marks the third time a rotational Dragon crew will fly will be on a commercial spacecraft. Each of our crew members low, brings low a diverse at this set of experiences to today's Additionally, flight. you are go for Section Roger 6. Is the when ready, report go for launch. Dragon spacecraft and the Crew 3 mission. Chari is responsible for all phases of flight from launch to re-entry. Once on board station, he'll serve as an Expedition 66 flight engineer. He was born in Milwaukee, but considers Cedar Falls, Iowa, his hometown. He is a colonel in the U.S. Air Force and joins the mission joins the mission with extensive experience as a test pilot. Over his career, he has accumulated more than 2,500 hours of flight time. This will be the first space flight for Chari, who became a NASA astronaut in 2017. He's also a member of the Artemis team, so he is eligible for assignment to a future lunar mission. And Tom Marshburn is the pilot of the Crew Dragon spacecraft and second in command for the mission, responsible for spacecraft systems and performance. Once aboard station, he will serve as an Expedition 66 flight engineer and is scheduled to assume and command of the station for Expedition 6.4, Section 4.100. Copy Dragon, you are go for launch. All right, and that call endurance is a go for launch. Exciting news. Again, Tom Marshburn is a Statesville, North Carolina native who, began, who became an astronaut in 2004. Prior to serving in the astronaut corps, the medical doctor served as a flight surgeon at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston and later became medical operations lead for the International Space Station. The Crew-3 mission will be his third visit to the space station and his second long duration mission. And the Crew Dragon will be the third spacecraft for Marshburn to fly in after the space shuttle and the Russian Soyuz. He previously served as a crew member of STS-127 in 2009 and Expedition 34 and 35, which concluded in 2013. Kayla Barron is a mission specialist for Crew-3. As a mission specialist, she will work closely with the commander and pilot to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and reentry phases of flight. Once aboard the station, she will become a flight engineer for Expedition 66. Barron was born in Pocatello, Idaho, but considers Richland, Washington her hometown. She earned a bachelor's degree in systems engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland in 2010, and a master's degree in nuclear engineering from the University of Cambridge in England in 2011 as a Gates Cambridge scholar. Lieutenant Commander Barron earned her submarine warfare officer qualification and deployed three times while serving aboard the USS Maine. At the time of her selection as an astronaut candidate in 2017, she was serving as the flag aide to the superintendent of the U.S. Naval Academy. And Matthias Maurer will also be a mission specialist for Crew-3, working with the commander and pilot to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic launch and reentry phases of flight. He will also become a long-duration crew member aboard the space station. Maurer comes from Zonkt Wendel in the German state of Saarland. Before becoming an astronaut, Maurer held a number of engineering and research roles, both in a university setting and at ESA. In 2016, Maurer spent 16 days on an undersea mission as part of NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operations, or NEMO, Space Analog. Like Chari and Baron, Maurer will be making his first trip to space with the Crew-3 mission. Each of these four crew members will join Expedition 66 once they arrive at the International Space Station with Russian cosmonaut Anton Shkaplerov as commander. Yep, and it looks like we are just under one hour from liftoff now. And this day is a continuation of regular crew flights to the space station from U.S. soil. This will be the fourth flight Dragon, this will be the fourth flight of Dragon with NASA crew and its third long duration mission to the International Space Station. And today our crew is flying the newest Dragon in our fleet and will be taking a ride on board the Falcon 9 that supported the CRS-22 mission back in June of this year. Now it's been a great countdown so far, weather is still looking good, so the excitement is continuing to pick up here as we get closer to that T-Zero. That's right, we started our coverage with suit up just over three hours ago. The SpaceX team helped the crew put on their suits and conduct initial checkouts before crew walkout. Crew walkout was where Raja Chari, Tom Marshburn, Kayla Barron, and Matthias Maurer gave final goodbyes with friends and 
family gathered outside of the operations and checkout building before they began that roughly 20 minute ride to pad 39A. And though it was just after sunset and already dark outside, we did still get some awesome views of those Teslas heading down the NASA causeway before the crew arrived at the pad. And once they arrived, they all took a brief moment to enjoy the view of the vehicle that they will be taking flight on and then headed up the fixed service structure to begin a process known as crew ingress where the astronauts entered the vehicle and the SpaceX team performed a series of checks to ensure that the suits, seats and vehicle interactions were all functioning properly. Then about 30 minutes ago, the team closed Dragon's hatch with the crew safely inside. So again, we're just under one hour to go until Dragon starts breathing fire. Things will pick up as we get close to the go no-go pole to arm the launch escape system and begin propellant loading. Now the crew pull for readiness was completed at T minus 60 minutes and the Dragon pull for prop load uh, is coming up here in about a minute at T minus 55 minutes. Now next up at T minus 45 minutes after that will be an internal mission control Hawthorne pull and then the launch director's pull for propellant loading. When we get to about T minus 40 minutes, the crew access arm will retract and the crew will get to will get the call to close their visors and arm the launch escape system. Now this is the automated system in place that can fire the eight Super Draco thrusters on Dragon to quickly separate the crew from the rocket, either on the pad or during the flight on the ride uphill. And then once we reach about T minus 35 minutes, propellant loading for the Falcon 9 will begin. Throughout the countdown, we've been getting some pretty incredible views of the astronauts inside Dragon, making their final preparations, as well as some close-up views of those suits. The teams have often described the suits as an extension of the Dragon spacecraft, almost a mini spacecraft inside of a spacecraft. We're standing by now for that call for propellant loading. Again, that should be coming up here at about T minus 55 minutes. Uh, so we're just about roughly 40 seconds away from that. The crew in position, ready to go. Taking a look at those monitors above them. And from the view that you can see on your screen, we have Raja Chari, the commander of Crew 3, uh, closest to the screen with Tom Marshburn in the pilot seat next to him. With everything still proceeding well, let's send it back to the team in Florida. Daryl, how's it going there? It's going great out here, ladies. And uh, we're here with NASA astronaut Shannon Walker. If you want to get a question in, hashtag Ask NASA on Twitter, and she will do her best to answer your question. And by the way, speaking of social, Kennedy is hosting a virtual NASA social on our Facebook page. People who have joined are posting messages, pictures, and videos with uh, their fellow space fans. And we want to share now four video messages that came into our virtual social for Crew 3 that were posted by the last four crew members to fly on Dragon. That is the crew of Inspiration 4. I want to wish uh, the astronauts of Crew 3 all the best on their journey to the space station. It's going to be one heck of a ride. Falcon 9 and Dragon, as you guys know, is a, an incredible vehicle. Hi everyone at Virtual NASA Social, I'm Dr. Sian Proctor, I am the mission pilot from Inspiration4 and I just want to wish Crew 3 an awesome liftoff as they head to the International Space Station. Hi Raja, Tom, Matias, Kayla, Hank's here just to wish you well on your mission into space. I couldn't be more excited for you for the journey you're about to go through, getting into that Falcon rocket with your suits on that have your name on it is a feeling like no other. Crew 3, I just want to say I'm so excited for all of you. I know that rush of emotion that you're going to feel with your spacesuit on strapped into the capsule and you're about to have the best ride of your life. Just laugh the whole way up there like we did. I uh, just want to wish you all the best and uh, look forward to exchanging uh, some stories uh, a little bit down the road. Take care. Godspeed, Crew 3.
I love Haley Arsenault saying that she laughed the whole way up. I can uh, definitely relate to that. Can you really? Yes. Well, exciting, was so funny. It's an exciting ride. You're just happy. You're you just, just so laugh. thrilled. Yeah. That's that's fantastic. I, and whenever she says anything, it always brings a smile to my face. She has such great energy. Well, throughout the program, we've been answering your Ask NASA questions from social media. We have time now for a few more before Falcon 9 fueling begins. And so we'll pop it up on the screen. And Shannon, you've been answering them all show long. We appreciate that. So the question we have up now is, what are your tips for me to go to space? I'm a high school freshman from Poland dreaming of going to space. Yeah, so the first thing, the most important thing is to do well in school. Uh, we need people who are very accomplished and have lots of different skills, and it all starts with a good education. Now, being from Poland, you're going to have to apply to the European Space Agency to be part of their astronaut program, and hopefully they will have another selection one of these days. But to really do well in school and then go pursue a field of uh, work that really interests you. What you want to do is do something you're very passionate about, and um, that really, when you're passionate about something, you're going to do well at it, and it's going to stand out, and people are going to take notice. And it so, yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be a specific, you know, you, STEM is good, right? Right. But there have been people who have not gone into STEM and become astronauts. Uh, every astronaut that we have taken at, on the NASA side has got a STEM background. Oh, they do. And yes. so that is a requirement. That, that is a requirement right now. Now, of course, we're starting to fly more people and there are more opportunities to get to space. So it may not be a requirement in the future. But right now, at least on the NASA side, uh, you need a STEM background. A STEM background and study hard and get some good grades. Yes. Our next question, does it get very hot wearing the spacesuits or is the material breathable? Ah. <laughs> yes, no, the material is absolutely not breathable because you need those spacesuits to hold pressure should something go wrong in the capsule. So you need it to completely contain that atmosphere around you. So they can get a little hot, but the entire time you're in the suit, uh, they're flowing air through it to keep you cool. You've got an air conditioning system for the suit. Yes. Blowing that air around. Yes, exactly. You need the air to be blown around because you really don't want to end up with a carbon dioxide bubble right in front of your face. All right. Thank you so much, Shannon, okay. for answering those questions. And keep the questions coming. We appreciate them at hashtag ask NASA. Now we'll send it over to Marie, who is standing by with the deputy director of the Kennedy Space Center. Marie. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Marie. And I wanted to ask you about a special connection that you have to Kayla and Raja, uh, part of the turtle class of astronauts in 2017. You were actually on their selection board. Tell me about that. Oh, I sure was. In the class of 2017, we had the most applicants ever in the history of NASA, 18,353. And when it was all said and done, we picked 12. Of course, Raja and Kayla were part of that class. So to see them when they first walked in for their very first NASA interview and to know now they're on board the Dragon on top of the Falcon 9 rocket, it's just amazing. I'm very excited. And so much has happened in, in such a short period of time. You became the deputy director just earlier this year in the middle of a very busy launch campaign. We've seen private citizens launch from here at Kennedy this year. More of that is coming. Uh, we've got a regular cadence of these commercial crew missions to station. Um, and we're coming up on the 60th anniversary of Kennedy. So, uh, you know, so much has happened, like we said, in such a short period of time. What do you see ahead for the next 60 years of Kennedy Space Center? Well, I see it's just getting started now. So this started with a vision. 10 years ago, we flew out the space shuttle and we had a vision to create the world's premier multi-user spaceport for both commercial and government users. And now you're seeing it coming to fruition. So it's just gonna be, we have 24 launches now, more launches than any place else in the world. When we finish this year, we should have close to 50 launches and it's just gonna increase more and more. I want to also ask you about um, what is in the building right behind us. Of course, the Goliath uh, Vehicle Assembly Building, the Artemis uh, rocket, the SLS Space Launch System rocket is fully stacked. We want to show you a peek inside our gigantic moon rocket. Um, there it is. That is uh, the Space Launch System and the Orion capsule uh, being stacked on top. This is video from late October inside the Vehicle Assembly Building. And now that the rocket and capsule 
people are fully stacked. It stands at 322 feet tall, and that is taller, in fact, than the Statue of Liberty. Um, quite a sight in there, Kelvin. I don't know if you've had a chance to actually uh, go inside since that stack in October, uh, but it's just astounding. And and what what do you have to say about that if you've seen it inside? And what do we have to get through before that first launch of Artemis One? Okay, I saw it today, and I <laughs> see it about uh, every week. You know, and it is it, it is just humongous to see that rocket and to know that that rocket will carry our astronauts to the moon and beyond, hopefully to Mars. So right now we're undergoing something we call IVT, Interface Verification Test. We'll do that for a couple more days and then we're getting prepared to roll it out for a wet dress rehearsal. So hopefully that'll happen at the end of this year, early next year. We'll roll it out to the pad, fully fuel it, test all the interfaces, pad, vehicle, and um, roll it back for a launch, hopefully in February. Fantastic, Calvin Manning, thank you so much. And by the way, happy Veterans Day a little early. Uh, I know you serve, so thank you for your service. Hey, thank you, Marie. All right, we're gonna go over to John Innsbrucker now in Hawthorne as the action begins to pick up on the pad. John. We're just inside T-minus 47 minutes. We're listening right now to the countdown net, waiting for the SpaceX launch director to discuss the propellant load and launch poll results and give final instructions to the launch team. At this time, we have completed all checks on the Falcon 9 and the Dragon spacecraft. We're also checking with the Dragon mission director to make sure that they are ready to go. And right now we're waiting to listen for that launch director to come up. Now we have been checking, as I said, with the Dragon mission director, also NASA launch manager to make sure they're ready. Now you can see on the screen right now, Falcon 9 on the pad, crew access arm alongside the Dragon capsule. Earlier you saw the vehicle assembly building during that previous interview. The, the Falcon and Dragon launch team, as well as key members of NASA are in the launch control center, which is just adjacent to the vehicle assembly building. And as you saw earlier, if you were with us, they've got a view straight towards pad 39A through the large windows of firing room four. Now, going back to the current screen view, you can see the crew access arm. That arm, once we finish the readiness poll and instructions to the crew, or instructions to the launch attention team. Attention on countdown net. And here it the comes. The poll is complete, and teams have pulled go for propellant load and launch. Yeah, stand by okay. for hold SpaceX and launch SpaceX launch director says poll is complete. And for non-urgent, the no go conditions, brief CE protocol. or LD, and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues effect affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed to the launch abort auto sequence. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off, relying solely on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fire is imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. For those in firing room 4 here at KSC, in the event of a fire alarm, operators noted below 56.80 will remain at their post while the alarm is evacuated. In the event that personnel safety is threatened, evacuate to the south facing emergency exit leads directly outside. Launch control at this time, you may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Just over T minus 44 minutes, we're going to send it back to Daryl and the team at Kennedy Space Center as we get ready to move the crew access arm. That's right, John. We are waiting that big moment here at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida as we do. We are T minus 43 minutes and counting and Correct. just got some. Has started. And there is the retraction. Great shot of the dragon moving. It does, it's not moving, the crew access arm is. It's moving away from it, yep. And you can see that from inside the dragon as well. And there it goes. When you're in the capsule, can you see that? You can, you have windows uh, that are at pretty much your foot level and you can, you can see a little bit out. So you do see that moving away. And once it's gone, you know it's just you and the rocket. There's the camera pointed directly at Dragon. Great view there. You can see the strong back at the top. Oh, that is a fantastic view.
And this crew access arm can move faster than it's doing right now under certain circumstances, right? Absolutely. If it uh, needs to go back to uh, being up against the capsule, it can move quite quickly, actually. It was just uh, not too long ago, about an hour ago, that we saw the astronauts walking down that very crew access arm. Now it is rotating away from the rocket. Just one more step closer to launch. An important milestone. Absolutely. I'm enjoying uh, just watching the, the various parts of the launch pad go by <laughs> yes. as we look out that Yeah, you don't that often arm. get that view, so no. it is, might as well soak it in while we've got it. There's nobody inside that arm. There's nobody on the pad. The only people who are there are the four astronauts inside that SpaceX Dragon capsule. You can see the water deluge system to the left out the uh, opening there to the white room. Crew access arm retraction complete. And we just heard the call out that the crew access arm has completed its retraction away from the rocket. And so up next, Dragon SpaceX, you are go for section seven of 4.100, close visors and arm the launch escape system. And there's captains, we're going for what's section seven of 4.100. Arming the launch escape system. And while we await that, let's take a social question. Oh, Michelle. that sounds like a great idea. Michelle Stone asks, as an astronaut, what moment does it become real that you are about to launch to space? You know, Michelle, it is right about now. So you know everything else has happened according to plan, and this is really the final, final bit before you launch into space. So anything had gone wrong previously, the access arm was there, and you could just exit the capsule. Now and it's just you and, and the rocket. Are closed. We're on the launch escape system. And arming the launch escape system, as we just heard that call, is, is a Physics major, copies. major milestone. Because you know, if for some reason something were to happen, that's how you're getting off the top of that rocket. That is correct. If something happens, if it's detected on the ground or by the systems on the uh, Dragon or the Falcon 9, um, it will engage that launch escape system and that crew will go shooting off that rocket. Let's take another question now. Shannon, been doing so well with these questions. I love answering questions. <laughs> well, excellent. Here's another one. Are there pre-launch rituals and activities that the crew go through before launch? You know, we do have some, um, I would say, traditions, and it's kind of interesting now that we're in the commercial Launch escape system is verified armed. Okay, the launch escape system is armed. Endurance copies, we see the same. Um, so we have... Uh, traditions that come from the Apollo days. We've got traditions that uh, we actually experienced over in Russia when we were flying on Soyuz's, and so we sort of combined a few. Uh, a lot of them, as you've seen earlier, involves uh, the crew sticking their stickers on various yes, places. Yes, yes. <laughs> Everywhere you can. Everywhere we can. <laughs> <laughs> we want people to know we were here. <laughs> and one more question for you, Shannon, as we await the loading of propellant into the Falcon 9 rocket. Hey NASA, while watching the launch of Crew 3, I noticed the astronauts have a little mirror on their suits on their left arm. Mm -hmm. What are they for? Yes, good eye to notice that. Good eye. Good eye. Yes, that mirror is actually uh, will let you um, inspect your spacesuit uh, to make sure everything is fine. So once you're in the spacecraft by yourself, if you open your visor and you need to shut it, you want to make sure in my case, that your hair is not crossing the boundary and would interrupt the seal that is, is necessary to keep that pressure on the inside. So they use that to make sure uh, their spacesuit is in perfect condition. How about that? I, I hadn't even noticed it. <laughs> it, it, is, it is wonderful when we get these questions um, from the viewers and the people who are watching because right. they're, they're looking so closely. They are looking closely and it's great that uh, people are picking up those details. Well, let's take another one then, since uh, we've got uh, some great questions coming in. 
can you keep your spacesuit after the mission? Oh <laughs> man, I wish I could keep my spacesuit. I don't know where I would put it, but no, um, unfortunately we are not allowed to keep our spacesuits. You couldn't stuff it and put it in the foyer? I, I suppose I could, <laughs> that would be a bit pretentious, don't you think? But, but you yeah. know what's interesting is if you don't keep it, it is made exactly to your specification, so. What do we do with it? So, right. um, yeah, actually, after a flight, the spacesuits go into rotation for training. And so, at this moment, uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, who is about my size, is using my spacesuit for her training so while that? her spacesuit is being built. Ah, okay. So they really are used yes. again, but not for space flight. They go into a, a life of training. That's right. Great questions, folks. We really appreciate these. These Falcon are these are some good ones. And, and Shannon, in approximately 25 seconds, expect loud venting. So we're getting a call out as we prepare for propellant loading. And you see the crew there, crew three. And they have their visors closed, so they are ready. They have them closed before the launch escape system is activated in case or yeah, activated in case it needs to be put into action. They will be safe in their suits. Another safety measure as we are here at the Kennedy Space Center taking another question from social media. Shannon, what was it like to feel the weightlessness of space for the first time? Oh, that is such an interesting feeling when that happens. Uh, of course, I felt it for the first time on the Soyuz spacecraft. Um, when we got into space and the engines cut off, to me it felt like we were sort of tipping forward. I felt like I was floating forward in my um, huh. in my harness that was holding me down. Huh. That's don't just know the why. I don't think got. we were, but that's what it felt like. Yeah. And not too long after you get up into space, um, don't you get ready to sleep in anticipation for getting to the space station? It, it really depends on your profile. So what okay. uh, the Crew Dragon will do is what we did on our flight up, which also had a 22-hour-ish rendezvous. They will go through systems checks, make sure everything is working on the Dragon, and then they will have a sleep period before they do the final rendezvous. And I want to ask a follow-up on this question. Okay. What's it like to sleep in space? <laughs> like, wh what happens? Is your, like, does your head kind of, what does your head do, and, and how do you get comfortable with not being against anything? It is, it is interesting to sleep in space. Uh, it is actually pretty comfortable to sleep in space, huh. but it does take a little bit getting used to. I will tell you, uh, the first time I was up there, for about the first month, I would wake up in the middle of the night and feel like I needed to turn over, but of course, that's not going to do you any good in space. So you, <laughs> that's just part of adjusting to learning how to sleep in space. There's certainly no pressure points, are there? There are no pressure points. <laughs> you just tucked into your sleeping bag. <laughs> are you s restrained? You have a sleeping bag on the space station. You have a sleeping bag that's inside your crew quarters, and that uh, sleeping bag is attached to the wall. So you sort of float inside your sleeping bag, which is attached to a wall. All right. Great job, Shannon. Thank you for all the uh, answers to the questions there. And thank you, folks for sending them in. They were wonderful, we enjoyed them, and Shannon did a great job of answering them. Just a few seconds away from prop load. Good job, everybody. Propellant load has started. And there we heard the call out. Yes. This rocket is being loaded with propellant. Yes, obviously another major milestone, and that is something that is very obvious to the crew. They can feel it um, loading into the tanks. It starts uh, low down at the bottom of the rocket, but as the as the uh, the propellant gets, uh, the tanks get more full. You it, it gets more vibrations and and uh, louder as it gets uh, closer to the crew. Yeah, you can you can hear that inside you the capsule, right? You can definitely hear it. You know something big's getting ready to happen. Absolutely. Well, we are T minus 34 minutes and counting away from the launch of Crew Dragon's third flight with astronauts and the second for 2021. Today begins the next six month rotation mission to the International Space Station. The launch escape system is armed as we just heard, which happens just before we have started loading propellant onto Falcon 9. That propellant is now flowing into Dragon. The Dragon capsule was loaded with its propellants about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road at what we call Dragonland. And in order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer. So for the fuel, we use monomethyl hydrazine or MMH and nitrogen tetroxide or NTO for the oxidizer. Together, these propellants feed the Draco engines that must maneuver Dragon on orbit, as well as the eight super Draco engines that would power the launch escape system in an abort scenario. And again, that fueling, it is flowing. 
and that means the eight Super Draco engines inside Crew Dragon are ready. If needed, they can launch the capsule away from the Falcon 9 rocket in an instant, should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the pad. And the NASA and SpaceX teams have trained extensively for exactly that type of uh, contingency. So we'll send it over for now to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne for an operations update with John I. We're counting down those final minutes. Everything's still looking good for Falcon 9 and Dragon for an on-time launch just over 32 minutes from now. Falcon 9 did begin propellant load on time at T-minus 35 minutes. You can see Falcon 9 on the pad, the first and second stages. They're being loaded with two liquid propellants. One is a fuel loaded into a tank at the bottom of the stage. The other is an oxidizer that loads into the tank at the top of each stage. The fuel that we're using to power the Merlin engines is a refined kerosene referred to as RP-1. And the oxidizer loaded on each stage is densified liquid oxygen or LOX. Now, densified is the term that we use to describe that we keep it much colder than typical for launch vehicles. Now it allows it to take up less volume, and therefore we can put more liquid oxygen onto the first and second stages. Now to ignite the fuel and oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine, we use that favorite ignition fluid called T-TEB. Now when T-TEB comes into contact with oxygen, it'll burn, and that gives off a green colored flame. Once we've got the flame going, we add the kerosene fuel into the Merlin engine chambers, and the engine ramps up to full power. You probably won't be able to see the green flash at ignition of the nine Merlin engines on the first stage, but you may see it on the second stage engine when it ignites following stage separation about two minutes and 48 seconds into flight. We're now beginning to top off helium into pressure vessels on both stages. We've been quiet for most of the countdown, but now we're gonna squeeze that last little bit in, make sure that the tanks are fully up on the pressure vessels. We'll use that gas to pressurize the propellant tanks in flight the Merlin turbo pumps will be pulling propellant out of the stage and we need to take up uh, or make up that empty space with hot helium. Now at the very top of the stack is the Dragon spacecraft. The astronauts are monitoring their systems while propellant is loaded into the Falcon 9. We heard them talking about uh, the noises of propellant loading. Third stage one cryo helium And in loading. this case, the crew training in the simulator also includes playback of sounds that have been recorded in the Dragon capsule during recent flights. Good news on the range, they are ready to support. They've been doing the balloon launches, they've been making sure that the air and sea space is clear and they are go to support launch. And the good news on the weather front, a little while back, the launch weather officer came and reduced the probability of violation from 30 to 20%. The biggest thing that we're gonna be looking for is uh, precipitation and that's less than 10%. The wind speeds are low, probably about, about five miles per hour or less. So everything is actually looking good. Now, as a reminder, we do have an instantaneous launch time for tonight's countdown. So from this point on, if we hear hold, hold, hold for any reason, we'll have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity tomorrow night, which is about just under 24 hours from tonight's planned launch. But with that, everything's looking good, and we're going to turn it over to Jesse and Courtney for an overview of what comes after liftoff. Great, thank you, John I. We love good news. For crew three, the astronauts' flight to station will take about 22 hours. As we await T minus zero in just about 28 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a series of systems checks to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. You're looking at a live view of our teams at the Cape as they prepare for liftoff. As we wait for the launch clock to hit zero, we wanted to give you an overview of what the ascent portion of the mission will look like. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from the historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into flight, Falcon 9's engines will throttle down to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket or what we typically refer to as Max-Q. It's worth noting that once we hit Max-Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Now, once we are through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our nine Merlin engines again. Now, from there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen in rapid succession. 
First is MECO, or Main Engine Cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is our second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to the Earth for landing as the second stage continues on its journey with the third event. SES-1, or second stage engine start number one, is where the MVAC engine lights up and propels the second stage, along with our Crew-3 astronauts, into orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back to Earth. The first is the entry burn, where three of the nine M1D engines will reignite and then shut down. Now, this helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. While the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once that happens, we will wait for confirmation of a good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn is just a single engine burn, but it's powerful enough to bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land on the drone ship at about nine and a half minutes into the mission. And while Falcon 9 first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. Once Dragon is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. It's worth noting that these are not the Super Draco engines that would be used during an abort scenario. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, exposing its guidance navigation controls, or what we call GNC, that will help the Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. And lastly, once the nose cone is deployed, the remaining Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead will be checked. From there, over the next 22 hours, Dragon will be in its rendezvous and approach phases, undergoing a number of phasing burns as it makes its way to the International Space Station. All that will be coming up soon, but for now, let's check back in with Sandra in Mission Control Houston. Sandra. Thanks, Courtney. The space station team here in Houston is focused and the critical systems on the station continue to function normally. The teams have verified the command path from the ground up through our constellation of communication satellites to the space station. Everything is nominal and the station will be ready to receive Dragon tomorrow. Once the crew arrives at station, they'll join Expedition 66. While on board, their official designation will be flight engineers for most of their expedition. At the back end of their journey, Tom Marshburn will assume command of the station from current space station commander Anton Shkaplerov. Flight Director Rebecca Wingfield is on console now, leading flight controllers in Houston for launch and will also lead teams for docking tomorrow. A reminder that a launch today will take about 22 hours to get to station, with the docking to the Node 2 forward port scheduled tomorrow, November 11th at 6 p.m. Central Time. Once Dragon is fully docked to the station, the team here in Houston will assist the Dragon and Space Station astronauts with leak checks as they work to open hatches on both Dragon and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch open to take place approximately two hours after docking. That's it for us here in Mission Control Houston. I'll send it back over to the team in Florida. Daryl. All right, thanks, Sandra. We are back here at the Kennedy Space Center, circling about that mock dragon behind us. Yes, yeah, pretty. It's a pretty capsule. This lady right here flew on one, <laughs> Crew One, not too long ago and had an incredible experience, six months six up on the International Space Station. Yes, six months. It's hard to believe that I've been home uh, six months already, but. <sighs> Here you are, Here ready to watch a launch. Watching the next one go. T minus 23 minutes and counting. And if you're just joining us, um, we are ready for the uh, third astronaut rotational flight and mission to the International Space Station under NASA's commercial crew program. Commander Raja Chari, Pilot Tom Marshburn, and Mission Specialist Kayla Barron. There you see them. They are uh, strapped in along with Matthias Maurer, ready to fly inside Crew Dragon Endurance. We can see them 
Live as well as outside, the Falcon 9 rocket fueling operation is well underway. The launch escape system is armed, and that means Crew Dragon is prepared to launch itself away from the Falcon 9 rocket in the case of an emergency on the pad or after liftoff. So far, operations look and sound as expected, and we are just counting down to that liftoff at 9.03 p.m. Eastern Time. You can see the, the, the steam as it comes off, the condensation as it comes off the rocket. Um, I've noted in past launches that as it fills with fuel, the entire first stage uh, begins to let off, and it kind of gives you a marker of exactly where in the rocket uh, <laughs> well, they are. It's almost like a little fuel, fuel gauge. Exactly. Yep, uh, because the um, fuel and oxidizer are cryogenic, they are extremely cold, and so uh, you just see them condensing the air around it. And of course in Florida, we've got lots of moisture in our air to condense. We sure do. There's some onshore flow, a weather pattern that is bringing uh, moist air off the Atlantic Ocean. And so uh, with this lit up, we should see a lot of this condensation coming off this particular rocket. The mission is the continuation of rotational crew flights to the International Space Station from U.S. soil on private rockets and spacecraft. This would not be possible without the success of NASA SpaceX Demo-2 test flight last year and the safe delivery of Crew-1 astronauts, including, including my co-host Shannon Walker, to the space station last fall for a long duration mission. Crew-1 is back home, of course, and we have one of the mission specialists with us right here today. As you're counting down, we're only 20 min 21 minutes out from launch, Shannon. What, what is going through your head in this moment? Boy, this is, uh, this is really, um, you know, things get even more intense and more exciting. You're, you can feel the rocket being fueled. You know you don't have too much longer, so um, you're really thinking about the, what you're going to need to do as soon as those engines light. T-minus 21 minutes and counting. The excitement levels rising for the crew inside. Crew Dragon Commander Raja Chari, he'll be making his first trip to space. And as commander, he is responsible for all phases of flight from launch to re-entry. Chari is a colonel in the U.S. Air Force. He holds degrees in astronautical engineering and aeronautics. Chari is also a combat veteran, having flown F-15E aircraft during Operation Iraqi Freedom and deployments in the Korean Peninsula. As a test pilot, he has accumulated more than 2,500 hours of flight time in various military aircraft. His pilot is Tom Marshburn sitting right to his right. You see Chari there on the left. Marshburn is suiting up for his third space flight. As pilot, he is responsible for spacecraft systems and performance. He previously flew on the Space Shuttle Endeavor and STS-127 and Stage on the Russian RP1 Soyuz. Load complete. In Expedition 3435, while helping to assemble the International Space Station on STS-127. In that flight, Marshburn performed three spacewalks, totaling almost 19 hours. It was just go, go, go. A North Carolina native holds degrees in physics and medicine. In fact, he was an emergency medicine uh, doctor. Yes, he was. Mission specialist Kayla Barron, she's about to make her first trip to space. In this role, she will work closely with the commander and pilot to monitor the spacecraft during the dynamic phases of flight. The Washington State native has degrees in nuclear engineering and systems engineering. As a submarine warfare officer, she was a member of the first class of women commissioned into the submarine community, and she deployed three times while serving aboard the USS Maine. And lastly, on the end there in this shot is mission specialist Matthias Maurer. He will be making his debut space flight he will be the second European astronaut to fly on Crew Dragon. Maurer is from Sankt Wendel, Germany, and is a doctor of material science and engineering. He is the inventor of more than 10 patent applications, and he joined the European Astronaut Corps in 2015. Maurer has spent 16 days in underwater training during a NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations Challenge, and he's trained in sea survival training off the coast of China. And an interesting note about Maurer, he will become the 600th person in space. 
Six zero zero. Yes, even though uh, all four crew members will be traveling to space at the same time, we have to assign numbers, and he is number 600. He's landed on that big milestone. Chari gets 599, Baron is 601. What was Shannon Walker? You know, I believe I was number 518, uh, but don't quote me, I could be wrong, but <laughs> it's a, in the early 500s. We'll take a look at the NASA history books and yes. we'll figure it out. <laughs> Each of these four crew members will join Expedition 66 once they arrive at the International S uh, Space Station where Anton Shkaplerov is currently commander of the space station. You spent some time as the commander? I spent a very brief amount of time as commander. Right at the end of uh, our crew's time up there for about two weeks, I was commander after the Soyuz uh, crew left. All right, it was short. Sweet. But you were in charge. I was Short in charge. <laughs> Sweet. All right, let's go over to OSB2 and check in with Marie Lewis. Marie? All right, thank you, Daryl. I am here with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Thank you so much for being here tonight. What a pleasure. What a great evening. Looks like the rain has given us a break. Yeah, it's clearing up. We've got yeah. a great view of the pad. And uh, this must bring back quite a few memories from you. You launched from Pad 39A some years ago, and this is your first uh, crew launch here as the NASA Administrator. What has this experience been like for you so far? Well, just to have an opportunity to try to offer some leadership to this fantastic organization that where the impossible is routine. And uh, it, it's, it's just such a, a tremendous organization. Uh, you know, it's been voted the best place to work in the federal government for the last nine years straight. Stage two so load is it begun. any wonder that Everybody's excited all the time, and here's another reason what we're going to do tonight. Absolutely. And you launched on the space shuttle uh, 61C uh, years ago. How did that experience change you, and how do you think it's going to change the astronauts that are going to space for the first time tonight? It happens to every space flyer when you look back at Earth from the position of Earth orbit and you see this beautiful creation, our home, the planet, suspended in the middle of nothing. Uh, it's, uh, it, it makes you want to be a better steward of our planet. It's extraordinary. As you orbit the Earth every 90 minutes, uh, and then, of course, the properties of microgravity in space we're learning how to make new materials, new drugs. Uh, all of these things are going to come in a commercial operation that we're taking off the surface of the Earth and we're taking to space and now we'll take it to the moon and then who knows, we're going to take it on out into the cosmos. And Speaking of the success of this program, years ago, over 10 years ago, this program started. You were a part of that. There were a lot of skeptics at the time in the aerospace industry about shifting this low Earth orbit to commercial industry and this partnership with SpaceX. And here we are now. What does the success of this say about what we can do when we do it together? And still, Today, people have difficulty making that transition, but the proof's in the pudding. And the pudding is out there on launch pad 39A right now. Uh, a commercial operation with considerable NASA help and oversight, because when it comes to the safety of our astronauts, NASA's gonna be all over it. Uh, there's the proof. Uh, a very successful commercial operation. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, thank you so much for your time. Daryl, we'll send it back to you. All right, thank you, Marie and Administrator Nelson. Some good words there about our future exploration plans. Want to remind you, if you listen on radio, you can catch the frequencies for uh, our local radio. If you're in the area watching out at one of the locations, you can check it out on uh, local amateur VHF radio frequency 146.940 and UHF radio frequency 444.925. You can see it on your screen there. So if you need to step away from whatever you're viewing it on, be it your laptop, your tablet, you turn on your portable radio and you'll be able to listen in.
Now, as we get ready to launch in the final few minutes, we want to take a look at some pictures that have some particularly uh, significant meaning to the crew. Here they are, Crew <laughs> th Three, with their booster, a pre-flown booster. Crew Three will fly aboard a new Dragon capsule, but that booster is pre-flown. This one launched CRS-22 to the International Space Station five months ago, and looks like they're giving it some love. Yeah, it's always a good idea to hug your booster. <laughs> uh, it's pretty special to get to actually go touch the rocket that's going to take you into space. Well, it's about to pin them back in, uh, into their seats here in just a few minutes. At the time of launch, 9.03 p.m. Eastern, the space station will be flying 258 miles over the North Atlantic, about east of Newfoundland. You can see here the track of the International Space Station, and then from that moment, it will be catching up to the International Space Station once it leaves the coast of Florida. And with T minus 12 minutes and 30 seconds on, uh, until liftoff, we want to focus now on the pad as we proceed through the final stretch of the countdown. We'll turn it over to Hawthorne to take us through the launch and ascent. John? Thanks, Daryl. It's just over 12 minutes, and everything is still looking good for launch of Falcon 9 and Dragon. Falcon 9 did begin propellant loading on time at T minus 35 minutes. The RP-1 fuel loading on the second stage, you can see up at the top, the white cylinder at the very top of the stack. Fuel loading on that stage is complete. Fuel loading is continuing on the first stage. We're about 80% uh, of the way full, and it will finish up at T minus six minutes. The densified liquid oxygen loading is also underway on the first stage. We're about three-fourths of the way full. And we began loading liquid oxygen on the second stage about five minutes ago. Now, liquid oxygen loading is the last thing to finish. We'll wrap up first stage at T minus three minutes, second stage at T minus two minutes. Coming up, we're going to do final checks of various engine systems. Our thrust vector controllers are going to be moved. We call them TVC wiggles, where we move the engines back and forth slightly. We'll also be moving throttle valves on the engines to make sure that they are responding to commands from the ground in preparation for flight. The Dragon mission director has reported their team is working no issues. We're going to hear from Dragon in about a minute here on the countdown. Their comm checks are complete. You can see the access arm is retracted. The launch escape system is armed. Crew is strapped in and they're ready to go. They'll get their final instructions at T minus 10 minutes. They'll be told to configure their displays for launch. And that setup will give the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding and provide them constant updates on vehicle health. At T minus five minutes will be in terminal count and Dragon will go to internal power. And we'll hear continued call outs on the countdown net as we get closer to liftoff. And finally, easy to say, range is go, weather is go. So right now, Courtney, we're coming up on T minus 10 minutes. One of the things that we'll hear on Dragon flights that we don't hear on other ones is the abort uh, call outs during the countdown. Can you enlighten us a little bit on what goes on with that? Yeah, John, great to hear that everything is going well. We're continuing to ch to track that Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. But just in case anything were to happen, Dragon is fully prepared to initiate an abort. Upon liftoff, you'll be hearing number and letter combinations on Dragon's trip up uphill, which will mark different abort zones throughout the flight, the numbers signifying the stage of flight and the letter as the abort Dragon zone. Dragon SpaceX, the first two crew one displays are configured for launch. Copy, endurance displays are configured for launch. And copy that. Crew three, we are honored to have you at the controls today as the first crew to fly aboard Dragon Endurance. We wish you a great mission, feel look, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, sometimes when you try to fly on Halloween, you get a trick instead of a treat. But uh, how honored and appropriate to get to fly Endurance on Veterans Day. We're uh, proud and honored to represent the SpaceX and NASA teams as we head to the ISS to live and work on groundbreaking science for the next six months. And there we have it, some final words from the crew aboard Dragon and a good luck from the core here on the ground to the crew. John, with everything still looking good, that next milestone of engine chill is coming up next. That's right, the next major event that we have is T minus seven minutes. It's what we call the engine chill event. The big thing that happens there is we open the pre-valves that feed the Merlin 1D engines. So super chilled liquid oxygen 
will be trickling through the inlet to the Merlin turbo pumps and that'll help chill those turbo pumps down before we hit them with the full flow of liquid oxygen during the ignition sequence in the last three seconds before T0. So what we'll hear is a call out says so stage one engine chill has started. We'll be monitoring all nine engines to make sure the aux fuel free valves are all open. We're also chilling down second stage engine as we get ready for launch. And you'll hear an additional chill down of the second stage called out once we get into flight a little bit before two minutes into flight when we'll do a final chill of the upper stage engine turbo pumps. And if you might be able to hear behind me here in Hawthorne, a lot of uh, energy. Folks are gathered around Mission Control Center uh, watching on the big uh, monitors as we get ready for launch in just over seven minutes and 40 seconds. Now, in addition, as I mentioned before, as we get ready at seven minutes to open the pre-valves and begin the engine chill sequence, we're also getting ready then to move into uh, check-out check reviews. The fuel trim valves are being cycled. Make sure that those are working. We use that to throttle the amount of propellant going through the first stage down to the engines as we go through flight. Coming up on T-minus seven minutes, we'll listen into the countdown now. Stage one engine chill has begun. Well, you've heard it. We're through another milestone. Next one coming up here at six minutes. Yep, that's right, John. And that RP1 kerosene is filling that second stage. We're anticipating a little longer for that first stage to be completely filled with that RP1 refined kerosene. Liquid oxygen will continue to flow through the first and second stages up until the final few minutes before launch. That next call will be that the stage one RP load is complete. Coming up now in about 15 seconds. Stage one We'll RP1 stand by for that complete. call now. And confirmation, we have a complete fill of RP1 on the first stage. Now the first and second stage are completely filled with that RP1 kerosene. Now just under six minutes to launch until that instantaneous launch window today. The next milestone will be for Dragon to transition to configure for terminal count. And that's when Dragon's onboard computers will take control of the vehicle and Dragon will be on internal power, no longer relying on those lines from the ground. From there, Falcon 9 tanks will pressurize for strong back retract. That'll be another visual milestone. The clamps just below Dragon's trunk will open and the strong back will tilt back just two degrees, then right after liftoff back to 45 degrees. Again, RP1 kerosene filled on both the first and second stages. Liquid oxygen continues to flow through on the first and second stages. Standing by now for that call that Dragon has transitioned into terminal count. Dragon isn't configured for terminal count. Falcon 9 propellant tanks are pressurizing for sprung back retract. All right, John, some good calls. Dragon is now on internal power and Falcon 9 propellant tanks are pressurizing for strong back retract. Yes, thanks, Courtney. What we're waiting to hear now is the call out for strong back is retracting. This will be a two step process. First, we'll spend about half a minute opening right, up the arms that clamp begun. around the second stage. And there's the call out. The sequence has begun. So we'll slowly open up the arms around the second stage. We might get a view if we've got a close up of the camera. Then once the arms are open, the strong back alongside Falcon 9 will retract about two degrees away from the rocket. It'll stay there all the way through liftoff. And then as Courtney mentioned, at liftoff, hydraulics will then pull it down to about a 45 degree position above ground, and that'll give us the final clearance. It's that strong back right now that is providing the liquids, the gas connections, the electrical connections to the launch vehicle, especially the second stage. We're hearing some of the venting of the vehicle as we are uh, pressurizing and depressurizing at various steps. 
As we get ready, you'll see a burst of uh, depressurization there on the second stage. That's right, John. We're also anxiously awaiting the stage one liquid oxygen is complete on the first stage. You should hear that call coming up here shortly. Stage one locks load complete. And confirmation that the stage one locks load is complete. All right, now LOX is going to continue loading on second stage. Dragon That'll wrap up at T minus two power. Dragon's gone internal power. Now again, at T minus two minutes, we'll finish liquid oxygen loading. And then a typical event, we will drain the propellant lines that go along the strong back, and we'll typically get a large cloud of condensation. Uh, at about 90 seconds before launch as we see the propellants come back down off of the strong back to prepare for liftoff. Stage two locks load complete. Dragon is an auto idle. All right, Falcon 9. With that, Falcon 9 is fully fueled. We have fuel on both the first and second stages. Yeah, and both stages are filled with liquid. Loud venting. Filled with liquid oxygen. Dragon is also in auto idle. The flight computers on board Dragon maintaining their calculations, standing by for the T minus zero mark. That next call out will be that Dragon is in countdown, standing by now for that call. FTS is armed, Falcon 9 is in startup, and is now controlling. Dragon is in countdown. All right, the final minute before launch. Just 47 seconds to go. Everything is Dragon, ready for an on-time launch today. Go for launch. Endurance captains, go for launch. Ground teams are ready, and crew three is ready for liftoff, heading for that instantaneous launch window. Twenty seconds to lift off. Minus fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition and lift off. Got three. One alpha. Yeah. Laboratory in orbit. The International Space Station. Vehicle is pitching down range. And that's the call we want to hear. Good performance on that first stage so far. T plus 30 seconds. Captain 9, powered by nine Merlin 1Ds. Pushing Dragon into low Earth orbit on the way to the International Space Station. Power and telemetry nominal. Stage one throttle down. And we're into the throttle bucket. In preparation for Max Q. One Bravo. Copy, one, right, Bravo. one Bravo call is for 
the second stage abort mode on the first stage that is going to take them through the first stage burning just before the second stage activates off the coast of North Carolina. That next milestone coming up shortly will be MVAC chill underway. MVAC chill underway. There's a call out. We're getting the second stage engine turbo pumps ready for their ignition coming up in just a little more than uh, 40 seconds. We've got the major events coming up here shortly. We're going to get main engine cutoff at two minutes, 36 seconds. The stages will separate. Then the second stage will ignite, carrying Dragon on its way into low Earth orbit. Everything continues to look good. Stage one throttle down. Stage one throttling down at three and a half Gs. Getting ready for Miko. Miko. Stage separation. Stage two alpha. Copy, two alpha. All right, we have ig ignition of the second stage. And you saw that green flash Good, of that TTEP fluid. And crew three is now on their way to the International Space Station. On the left side, first stage. You can see the titanium grid fence coming out, the streaks uh, of the exhaust of the second stage engine going by, and the lights of Florida down in the background. Position is signal. That's right, and on your right, that second stage glowing. With that red color we like to see, indicating everything is proceeding well. Now three minutes and 40 seconds into flight, everything's still on track. Acquisition is signaled, Bermuda. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory and that nominal. Call, that call out of acquisition of signal copies. Bermuda, that just means the Bermuda ground station has the signals from the second stage of Dragon and Falcon 9. Now currently on the first stage, we are coasting to Apogee, beginning a slow 180 degree pitch so that when the vehicle comes back through the atmosphere, the engines are pointed down towards the drone ship when we do the relight. Relight for the entry burn will come at T plus seven minutes and 30 seconds, three minutes from now. Currently the first stage about 166 kilometers up, continuing to coast to Apogee for another brief period. Meanwhile, that second stage still propelling the Crew-3 astronauts up the eastern seaboard, and it will continue to fire. That's about a six-minute burn to deliver the astronauts into orbit. Dragon, SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Endurance copies. And a good call out from the ground teams. I always love to hear trajectory nominal, and the crew gets to hear it too on the call out. Acquisition of signal, New Hampshire. And the New Hampshire tracking station has acquired the telemetry signal. Five minutes and 30 seconds into flight today, everything is still proceeding nominal. And Courtney, right now on the second stage, uh, it's such a uh, large amount of propellant. It takes a while for second stage to uh, really accelerate. The crew right now Dragon looks like they're up, pulling about. Trajectory nominal. Looks like we're pulling about we're one and a half Gs. Sure. Yeah, right on cue, those check-ins on the second stage performance. Everything is still looking good on that second stage. The next milestone on the second stage will be Seco. And we're getting our views now from inside of Endurance, our first views of the crew on their way to the International Space Station.
We're one minute away from entry burn of the first stage. Hopefully we'll get a camera view back on the first stage as we uh, light the three engines to come back into the Earth's atmosphere. Dragon SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Endurance copies. Another good check-in with the crew, confirming everything is still looking good so far on both ends. That next milestone coming at seven minutes and 30 seconds will be entry burn start. Currently waiting for the call out from the SpaceX propulsion responsible engineer that the three Merlin 1D engines have lit to begin the slow, to begin slowing down the first stage prior to entering the Earth's Stage atmosphere. two FTS is safe. Stage one entry burn is in startup. We've heard stage one entry burn is startup. We've lit the center engine. We've got the two side engines, three engines running. This is a 27 second burn. This will slow the first stage down. We'll then enter the atmosphere where the grid fins begin to work, and then we will fire the single center engine as we approach the drone ship. Stage one, entry burn shut down. Confirmation, entry burn shut down. And meanwhile, that second stage is less than a minute away from cutoff. Stage two in terminal guidance. Shannon. Copy Shannon. There's that call for Shannon. Stage one is transonic. Stage one decelerating as we prepare for entry burn. But our attention is right now looking at stage two as we get and ready for shutdown. Shut down. Stage one landing burn. Dragon SpaceX, nominal orbit insertion. And the second stage has done its job. Our crew three astronauts have been delivered into orbit. Stage one, landing leg deploy. Landing uh -huh. leg deploy. And there's captains, we should feel Kiko and uh, Sile confirms we are in space. Dragon SpaceX, launch escape system is disarmed. Stage one landing is confirmed. And we've heard a call out. Stage one landing is confirmed. Signal Cape and acquisition of signal Newfoundland. Some great call outs. That next milestone is spacecraft separation around 12 minutes into flight. Getting a view now of the Crew-3 astronauts from a camera aboard Dragon. The crew now coasting in low Earth orbit, still attached to that second stage. Again, that next milestone coming in about two minutes. That second stage will separate and Crew Dragon will be flying free. And Courtney, right now, the Falcon 9 second stage is still attached to the Dragon capsule. When it's time, Dragon will command separation from the Falcon 9 second stage. Right now, that second stage, under control of its flight computer, is essentially going through a sequence to idle the second stage, make sure we're not pulsing any of the cold gas thrusters, the engine has been purged out, essentially anything that might cause motion of the second stage, we're making sure that all of that is eliminated so that when Dragon separates, it's got a very stable platform to move away from. I believe the cheering in the background, uh, they're getting video back of 
Falcon 9 first stage on drone ship as we get ready for Dragon separation. That's right, John. Separation coming just 10 seconds from now. Standing by for that call. Expected loss of the signal, wallops. And again, we are standing by. There we go. Dragon separation confirmed. Dragon, CE, welcome to orbit. Hope you enjoyed the ride from F9. Dragon will take you from here. Safe travels. Stand by for words from LD. And Endurance, LD here. On behalf of the SpaceX launch and recovery teams, it was a pleasure to be part of this mission with you. Enjoy your holidays amongst the stars. We'll be waving as you fly by. Cheers. Wow. Incredible views of the crew now in orbit on their way Thanks, to the uh, International guys, Space Station. It was a great ride, better than we imagined. And some final words from the crew as well. There they are, our Crew-3 astronauts. Now in orbit, that next milestone will be the deployment of the nose cone. That'll be about a five minute process. It'll expose those forward bulkhead Dracos and we'll prepare them for checkouts as well. Nick Courtney watching them in zero G right now, working their displays. It looks so easy, but we had the benefit of watching the, the launch team, the spacecraft team, the NASA team, everybody working here for the last weeks, working through this. And it's good to see it come out looking just so easy right now. Yep, it's been a long time coming and we're so excited to see them in orbit. Dragon SpaceX, nominal, nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. Endurance copy, VTSA will be opening advisor service. Well, it was a beautiful launch from here at Adios. Hawthorne headquarters at SpaceX headquarters here in Hawthorne. Um, I can't imagine how the launch looked from over at Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, pretty incredible launch. We also got to see their zero-G indicator on the screen. It looked like a little turtle, so I'd love to hear the story behind that. But uh, an amazing launch, an amazing day so far. Yeah, that's right. And with that, we'll go ahead and send it back to Kennedy Space Center. Daryl, how was the launch from your end? Well, it was simply stunning. Thanks. We're back here at the Kennedy Space Center with Shannon Walker, Crew-1 astronaut, Michelin specialist <laughs> from, that, from that mission. Wow. Wow is right. I mean, it was amazing. It's always so impressive to see a launch live. And, and what always strikes me is you get to see it and then you hear the sound after it's gone for a few seconds. It's truly amazing. The delay in the sound coming to us, but we're seeing the sights. And when it lifted off, there was that low cloud deck. Yes. So it like lit up the clouds, it lit up the ground. It was, it was one of the most impressive uh, launches I have seen. And that rumble was probably one of the loudest I've it, heard. I don't know, you know, I don't know how to explain that. I don't either. I mean, it seemed louder to me than most launches, and it, it was really rattling this whole uh, setup where we are here. Just a boom, and then we saw the zero G indicator. Yep. A turtle. A turtle, of course, because there's <laughs> turtles on board. <laughs> two turtles on board, and of course, they had to convince the other two astronauts to, to let go them do turtle, turtles. right? Right. And apparently, I, they did. I don't know how. I don't know who won that arm wrestle, but I guess it was the turtles. <laughs> it was the turtles. <laughs> All right, we're joined now by Frank Davina, ESA's program manager for the International Space Station. Thank you very much for joining us, and congratulations. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, yes, indeed, a beautiful launch. Uh, we have. Uh, our second uh, astronaut flying on uh, Crew Dragon uh, after Thomas that uh, just returned last night. That was in Cologne, <laughs> welcoming him in uh, Cologne uh, uh, after his space mission. And now I'm here uh, to see off uh, Matthias. It's a uh, great times for the European Space Agency. What a turnaround that must have been to be in Cologne there with Thomas coming back and literally just days later 
seeing off one of your ESA astronauts, Matthias Maurer. Yeah, it's a, it's a great time for us uh, because uh, we have uh, two astronauts back to back and we will also have Samantha Christopher right. that will fly uh, in April uh, next year. So for the first time, we will have for one and a half years uh, permanently uh, ESA astronauts on board of the space station. So it also shows uh, that ESA is really stepping up to the game. Uh, we, uh, we are more and more engaged in the ISS, but also in the Loon Mooner program uh, mm -hmm. with uh, our NASA colleagues in the Gateway. We will have three astronauts flying to the Gateway uh, before the end of this decade. Uh, we are doing a new astronaut selection, so exploration is really also taking off in Europe. And how did you enjoy the launch? Uh, were you watching from the uh, fifth floor of the Operations Support Building? No, I was actually in the LCC. Oh, and, uh, wow. So uh, I was okay. able to go outside and uh, go on the on the staircase on the outside, uh, nice. on the fifth, uh, fifth floor there uh, or something like that. It's uh, really amazing. Uh, like you said, uh, you see the, the light and then the sound and you're really on the stairs there. You feel uh, everything <laughs> rumbling. So it's a really amazing uh, launch. Now, you two are familiar with each other, Shannon Walker yes. and Frank DeVena. Yeah. Yep. Explain that. Well, we're, uh, we have common job, and so <laughs> American astronauts work with these astronauts, and so we actually go way back. Yeah, we go way back because uh, we were together in training, actually. Uh, yeah. uh, when I was uh, doing my mission in uh, 2009, uh, Shannon was yep. also in training on, uh, on Soyuz. So, right. uh, indeed, we go way back, and uh, we have worked a lot together. So tell me, did you get a chance to talk with Matthias before, um, you know, in the in the days leading up to launch? Uh, yes, I talked a couple of times uh, with him. Uh, not as much as I would have wanted because, uh, again, the launch was a little bit delayed and I had to be back in Europe uh, welcoming uh, Thomas. But uh, I think he's very motivated, of course. It's his first flight. Uh, it's always it's like always this. Uh, yeah. uh, of course, also a little bit curious what's going to happen uh, because uh, it's different. The second flight and the first flight is totally different. Uh, at least for me it was because... Uh, you go into the unknown yeah, and mm -hmm. it's always a little bit scary to go in, into the unknown. Uh, you know that uh, the people expect a lot of you. Uh, uh, Matthias has a whole science program, not only an ESA science program, mm -hmm. but also for the right. benefit of NASA, JAXA, and of course every astronaut wants to perform uh, to the best of his abilities and of course uh, that also brings uh, uh, these this thoughts with him. But I told him that he was excellent in training and I'm sure that he will do a great mission as well. ESA program manager for the International Space Station, Frank DeVinna. Thanks for joining us in the post-launch interview. We really appreciate it, and congratulations. Thank you very much. All right, let's send it over to Marie Lewis at the Operations and Support Building with another guest. Thank you, Daryl. I am here with NASA Associate Administrator Bob Cabana. Uh, this is your first crew launch officially as Associate Administrator. How was, how was the launch tonight for you? Oh, it was fantastic, Marie. Uh, what a beautiful evening for a launch. You know, it's like I tell folks, don't take pictures, experience it. And it was another great experience seeing those four guys take off into space on top of that Falcon 9 on that Dragon. How amazing. What a great partnership we have with SpaceX to enable that. I, I just, I couldn't be more proud of our team and what we've accomplished. And we now officially have had, have more than 600 people who have been to space. Matthias was number 600, Kayla, yep. Kayla Barron is number 601. Uh, what do you think about the trajectory that we're on for human space flight going forward? Well, it's absolutely outstanding. You know, what we want to do is enable a commercial economy in low Earth orbit so that we can focus on that really hard job of exploring beyond our home planet, going to the moon to learn what we need, going to the moon in a sustainable way so that we can learn what we need to go on to Mars eventually, establishing that presence in our solar system beyond our home planet. And to do that, we want to commercialize low Earth orbit and, and get as many folks as we can uh, go into space. And that's, that's what we're enabling right now. It's, I think it's an amazing time for America's space program. Uh, we are definitely at an inflection point on how we are commercializing space. And how about the future of the International Space Station in particular? I know that's near and dear to you because you helped build it. <laughs> I mean, on four different space shuttle flights, you were one of the first people to cross the threshold into the space station. I, you know, I can't believe it's been, you know, almost 23 years since that first mission that we've had crews on orbit since 2000. I mean, anybody that is 21 years old or younger in the world has never known a time that there weren't humans living in space. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's just, it's so darn outstanding. And what do you want to say uh, finally to the NASA and SpaceX teams uh, that have gotten us here today We're in this regular cadence of missions and also to our international partners? Well, first off, I want to say thank you. Uh, 
Thank you for all your dedication and hard work. You know, this is not an easy job. It, it is a huge challenge to safely get humans to and from low Earth orbit. And uh, the partnership that we have with our international partners, with our uh, commercial crew partners, you know, it has enabled this space economy that we have right now. I can't wait until we, uh, we get gateway around the moon. Again, an in international partnership as we go back to the moon in a sustainable way, it, it's absolutely outstanding. So I think the future that we have in space uh, is amazing, absolutely amazing. What a great time to be part of America's space program. Absolutely. Associate Administrator Bob Cabana, thank you so much for joining us. And happy Veterans Day, <laughs> uh, a little early, and happy Marine Corps Wait, birthday. That, more importantly, <laughs> yeah, that's right, 246 years round. Happy birthday to all the Marines. And, uh, you know, thank you for everybody's hard work that makes NASA such an awesome place to work, number one in the federal government. Uh, this is an amazing team, and I couldn't be more proud of them. All right, thank you so much. You bet. Daryl, we'll send it back to you. And Bob, thank you so much. And now you're looking at a view of the first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket, which has landed back on a drone ship out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the view cut out during our live coverage, but now you see it there. It landed, and it was a beauty. It was. And it's so amazing that they uh, do that time and time again. It flew CRS-22, it flew Crew-3, and it'll fly again. Yes, it will. Now, just a quick update on the launch operations. The nose cone, the nose cone from the Dragon has uh, been deployed open. off of it. Yep. And so that allows it to dock. So absolutely, that's one of the key milestones, uh, getting that nose cone open. You've got some engines underneath the nose cone, and of course the docking apparatus will allow it to dock to space station. That's ready to go, and now the astronauts will prepare for their 22-hour, roughly, yep. journey to the International Space Station. They will. They'll probably have a snack, and then get some sleep. All right. In the meantime, how about we do a social question? Oh, great. One Let's last one Let's for Shannon Walker. <laughs>